to you, Jabalpur College. Please tell what is the basic difference between basic difference between writing papers, research paper for conferences and journals, as I had already asked. Okay, thank you for your question. The question was, what is the basic difference between writing research papers for conferences and for journals? And Professor Kannan Maudgalia this morning, in fact, did talk a little bit about it. What I said in the morning is that everything we have learned today, or has, there's no difference between conference papers and research and journal articles, in with respect to what we decided or what we discussed today. I still stand by that statement. But since this question has come up a few times, maybe this is a good time to speak a few, uh, to spend a few minutes on it. The main, you, to understand this difference, what you have to realize is how the process of accepting or re rejecting conference papers work, works and how it is different from that, the process in the journal paper accepting, uh, acceptance or rejection process. Conference papers work on a very short deadline. They, there's usually three to six weeks in which the program committee has to go through several papers. And by several, it could be several dozen, sometimes two or three hundred, sometimes even more for large conferences in a very short period. So there is no time for the authors, for the reviewers to give suggestions and wait for the authors to respond and then give more feedback and so on. The reviewers will either accept your paper and say that please make these modifications, hoping that you'd make it, or they'd say that please submit somewhere else. So as an author, the first thing you have to do is to make sure or try not to give the referee reasons to reject your paper. I'm saying this in the negative way, but what I mean is if your paper violates some of the rules that we talked about today, it's very likely that the referee is going to reject it. So before the referee does that, it would be good if you can iterate your paper once again, perhaps get feedback from your colleagues and make sure that there is no reason for the referee to reject it because they have a very short time. Secondly, the purpose of a conference is again to share research results and to have open discussions on taking the field forward. There are a number of, uh, or in conferences often, Papers which have exciting results with some backup are accepted. I'm not saying that you should only have claims and no evidence, but let's say you have a great idea and you do some, you do some experiments or you provide preliminary proof that your idea actually works. It's a good idea to submit it to a conference instead of a journal. In a journal, on the other hand, the rigor of the methodology is a lot more strongly evaluated. So if you're submitting a paper to a journal, the referee is going to nitpick on how, for example, in the paper A versus paper B, that was sent to a conference, the paper A. If the authors had sent it to a journal, the journal would have said, you have eight students in your study. That's too small. The study is not sound, even though you have good results. So for in the, the journal referee would have said, repeat or replicate your study with a larger number of participants and then resubmit to the journal because you have a good idea. Because the idea was good and there was some proof, the conference did accept it. So I hope this gives a brief idea of the difference that you have to keep in mind uh, between when you're submitting to a journal versus when you're submitting to a conference. R.C. Patel Shirpur, over to you. I have a question uh, stating if at all if I have to prove my architecture any architecture uh, work which I have to prove. If I am comparing with some other architecture, existing architecture, where do I get the data set onto which I can implement or uh, experiment my work on that? Over to you. Okay. Uh, this is a question that is somewhat beyond my technical expertise. So what I'm going to do is try to abstract out the general question that you asked. And perhaps you can post the question on Moodle later and some of your other colleagues within the domain might be able to give a more, uh, let's say, more detailed answer. So 
the way I read your question is, if you have a new method, in your case it is a new architecture, it could be a new strategy to do something. So, you have a new technique, new process and you want to compare it with something existing. Where do you find systems to implement it or where do you find the data? Uh, this is just a suggestion. One thing you could do is, if you know that the data are available with some authors, you can write to those authors saying, look I have a new method and I would like to implement my method on your data. Would you mind sharing it with me? Because science is a collaboration and the field that moves forward when people work together and exchange ideas, there is a high chance that the other scientist who has the data or who has access to that system might say that, okay, this looks like an interesting experiment, I will share your data and let us work on this together. So, now the two of you are collaborating on that project, it is not that you are implementing your method on someone else's data, but two of you have now become collaborators, that is one way to go about solving this problem. The other way is uh, if any such data or systems are available in the open source domain, you can make use of it. Uh, again, if it is not available, you are out of luck, but for some situations you might be able to find either a system or you might be able to find data where this is possible. So, as I said, I, I, I am only able to answer your question from a very general point of view right now and perhaps some other colleagues can respond to you either in this chat or on Moodle later. Uh, hope that is fine. Let us uh, look at the next question from MES Pillay New Panvel. Over to you MES. Uh, madam, my question is what are the measures to decide the short paper and full paper and what is the main difference between the later and the paper to be published. Thank you, over to you. Thank you for your question and your question is what is the difference between a short paper and a full paper in a conference and how do you decide whether you should submit to a short paper or a full paper. Let me answer a slightly different, or let me make a slightly different point first. Sometimes you do not decide, but the conference program chair or editor decides and tells you to convert your full paper to a short paper, if you have submitted it as a full paper and at that point you have no choice. The reason the conference editors or program chairs might say that is they might find feel that you have a good idea which is worth discussing in the conference, but you do not have typically it means that you do not have sufficient evidence or sufficient details to fill a full paper. So, preliminary ideas with which are good and interesting and which have some backing are sometimes uh, uh, the editor sometimes asks the author to, uh, to resubmit as a short paper. If you wanted to make a choice, I think you can go by the same metric. Do you have sufficient details in your methodology and more importantly, do you ha have you done sufficient number of experiments to be able to provide the evidence for your claims? Can you defend your solution thoroughly enough? If you think you have all those data, try to write it as a full paper. If you think your work has some evidence, but it is still preliminary and perhaps it is not sufficient enough for a full paper, then you can think of submitting as a short paper. So, I would go by the same metric that the conference program chairs often use to make this difference. Let us look at a question from K J Somaya, Mumbai. Over to you Somaya. How to define the impact factor? Okay, thanks for your question. I did see this on Moodle and I did not answer it because I do not think we should care first, yeah, I do not think we should care. I know it is a strong statement I am making, but let me try to explain. Firstly, we 
we should not go about, the, we as in the authors or as teachers and researchers, it is not our job to determine the impact factor of a journal. There are professional organizations that do it for us and if the journal you want to submit to, do, if it does not appear in the list of other journals which have impact factors, it means that either the professional organization has not looked at the journal you are interested in or that the journal you want to submit to is too new to even determine an impact factor or it is so low, the impact factor is so low that it has not been included in the list. So, there could be many reasons why the impact factor of a journal is not mentioned. It should not be our job as teachers and researchers to try to determine the impact factor. So, that is the first meaning of I do not care or I do not think it should be our problem to try to determine what the impact factor is. The second one is a little more subtle and I think it is a very controversial issue. I, I might get into you know, a lot of you might disagree with me that as authors should we be looking into the impact factor of a journal when we submit a paper. And I, I think the answer really depends here. It depends on your institution. There are some institutions that do not consider publications in journals with, impact, with low impact factors as valid papers at all. There are uh, sometimes there are some, uh, for example, we have a student here who is enrolled as a PhD in some other university and that university says that you are only allowed to publish in the following journals. So, it often the impact factor is something which is externally imposed. In the large competitive wor world of scientific pub publishing, if your CV has bullets, with high impact factors, your there is something good and I put this word good in quotes, but I am not sure if we all are competing in that sense. I think let us just not focus on that issue at this point and instead focus on how to make our own research better and how to make it sound. Once you do it to decide where to send it for publication, look at the relevance which journal has papers that are similar to what you are interested in, which journals are read by the community that works in similar areas and use relevance as one factor. And of course, you can use impact factor to decide there, but let that not be your only criteria. And as I said earlier, do not even bother about trying to determine what is the impact factor of this journal versus that journal. Next question, PSG College Coimbatore. Over to you, Coimbatore. If the journal has its own format, is there any common specification for preparing a journal paper? Then why they have different formats, different journal has? I got part of that question, so I am going to give you a partial answer. The question had to do about format of journal or of a conference. We will discuss this a little bit more tomorrow, but just briefly, most conferences and all journals tell the potential authors how to format their pa paper. Often they provide a template on the conference website. Sometimes they may not provide their own template, but they might tell you to follow for example, the IEEE template. So, if the conference says use this template, please use that template and only that template, even if you do not like it. So, uh, more questions on formatting and which format to use are something that we will come back to tomorrow. Amrita Coimbatore, over to you. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, I am Sanjay Singh. My research title is uh, Numerical Analysis of Air Inlet Flow Through Scramjet Engine. And uh, I will be using uh, ANSYS CFX or any other CFD software uh, for my analysis. Uh, will you be able to suggest me how much description I have to give for CFD analysis? Uh, that CFD tool, uh, software tool, if I am utilizing it, how much description it is to be given in a uh, research paper, if I want to publish it. Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, the question is, okay, first part of the answer. Again, I am not a domain expert here. So, I am going to try to answer your question from a general point of view and for that I will try to translate your question, so that it is suitable for audiences of all domains. How much details of, so 
what the professor there was trying to do is uh, use a software tool to conduct some analysis. And the question is how much details of the tool itself do I have to give and how much details of the analysis technique do I have to give. The answer there really depends on how well known the tool is within the community or the community that you are sending your or uh, that, um, that you are sending your research paper to. If it is a tool that is not well known at all, you do have to give a lot of details. If it is something that every person within the field uses on a daily basis, you need not give a lot of details. So, I know it sounds uh, like a top level answer, but it does work as a rule of thumb. See whether that tool is relevant and important and see how frequently people use it. For example, do other papers doing work similar to yours also use that tool and you can get an idea of how much description you need to give by reading their papers. Again, this is a question if you need more details, you will have you can post it on Moodle and hope that somebody from your domain might have a better answer to. Again, so, uh, let, let me just uh, make a general statement here. This is a very unusual workshop because we have people close to 3000 people from a large number of domains. Most of them are in engineering, but still engineering is not a single field. However, we are trying to understand and create knowledge which is applicable for all of us. And it is quite interesting that there are these set of guidelines and thumb rules which are, which are not just superficial, but when we use those guidelines, each one of us could benefit. From that perspective, if you have a very precise question related to your domain, you can only hope for a more general level answer from our end. And if you want a more precise answer, ask your colleagues, senior colleagues in the field or read, read other articles published by senior members in your community, read international journals, read other national journals and that would give you an answer to some of your specific questions. The next question is from VIT Velour. Over to you, VIT Velour. I would like to explain is the method and procedures it is the same for technical paper presentation and a research paper on educational methodology. You are morning you are telling about the methods to be followed for a good paper. So is there any procedure differences between a technical paper research paper and a paper on general topic like educational technology. Okay, thank you for your question. The question is when we are talking about the methodology or procedure section, is there any difference between papers in a technical domain, for example, a specific engineering domain versus a paper about education or educational technology? Of course, there is going to be a difference in the details. So, for example, in a paper, as I said very specifically earlier, if your paper is about a study on teaching and learning and with students, you have to talk about which students or which teachers, that is what is called a sample. You have to talk about which instruments and you have to talk about how you did your study or how you implemented your treatment. In a paper where you have developed a new algorithm for solving some problem, you won't have the same details. You won't have a sample. You won't have procedure, and so, you won't have the same kind of procedure, and so on. So you have to determine what details in the methodology or procedure section are relevant to your field. So at that level, yes, there is a difference. However, at the higher level, where you have to describe and explain your solution, and we didn't do this today, but let me just mention it. You have to also say why you believe your solution might work before giving data. Is it sound? Is it logical? Is it complete? Is it sufficient? You also have to think about where your solution might not work. What are the assumptions you are making? Is there a scope to your solution? These questions or the answers to these questions I think will, not the answers, but thinking about these questions, the scope, the boundaries, why your solution might work 
arguing necessity and sufficiency. These are common across papers in any domain, because these have to do more about thinking and logic and coherence, and they are not, you have to use the domain to answer the questions, but the questions themselves arrive, arise more from the issues of clarity and of thinking. Let us look at the next question from NIT Warangal. Over to you, NIT. This is Chandrasekhar V. Talking from uh, NIT Warangal Remote Center, we have been uh, doing the paper writing activity in the past. Today morning, uh, you have highlighted the importance of the paraphrasing activity. The, design, the disciplines happen to be engineering and uh, highly technological oriented uh, in nature. Doing paraphrasing activity is a laborious and uh, sometimes uh, cumbersome task. How to do this in an efficient and uh, simple and easy and more useful way for the so many researchers who have been doing research in the various emerging fields of computer science, engineering, etc. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your kind words, Warangal. And the question there was about paraphrasing. I just mentioned it in the morning and said it was important. We will do a session about it tomorrow morning. That would, I think, be the first session. I would repeat what I said in the morning that even if your domain is highly technical and even if you are working on some cutting edge problem in computer science, you are not allowed to borrow blocks of text from other people's writing and put it in your own paper. Whether you do it to make your process easier or whether you do it unintentionally, unfortunately it will get labeled with the ugly tag of plagiarism. And all of us, none of us want to go there. So what paraphrasing really means is, or what I meant by paraphrasing there was, if you read somebody else's writing and you want to mention it or discuss it within your own writing, how do you represent the other person's idea? You have to do it in your own words. You have to do it in such a way that it fits your context. That, that's what I meant by paraphrasing. And that's done in all disciplines. If you may, sometimes we do quote or use two or three words and quote them directly. But even an entire sentence, if we have to replicate as is verbatim from somebody else's writing, we have to make it sure that we tell everybody that this is quoted from somewhere else and we are re reproducing it verbatim. So there are ways in formatting that you would do it. You would say quoting so and so, you might use quotation marks, you might use block indents and so on. Paraphrasing goes much beyond that. You might read somebody else's writing and you'll, you may find that the entire section on their, uh, their results are interesting and relevant for your paper, but now you have to write that in two or three lines and connect it to your work. That is paraphrasing. I do not believe that, or I do believe that even technical papers have to do it all the time. I hope that answers your question. Let us look at SRM Kanchipuram. Good evening, ma'am. In certain case, when we submit the paper to the journals, they simply reject without even giving the reviewer's comment. So what could be the reason, how to improve the paper? Over to you question here is what, ha what to do if we get a reject from a journal or a conference without, and they give us no reason. And believe me, it is very painful. I am sure it was very painful even for you and that is why you are asking this question. Uh, what I would suggest at this point or, and especially after these two days of the workshop, you have now more tools in your writing skills toolbox. You know some common things that referees are looking for. So what you could do is first do a self check, self assessment of your paper and see if any of these features that we talked about today is missing or any guideline is violated. What we are trying to do here today and tomorrow is to also take you through the minds of the referees and try to help you under, try to help you get into the referee's mind just like we've been talking about getting into the author's mind 
For example, the referee is looking for clearly stated contributions. If they don't find it within the first 10 seconds, or let's say 30 seconds of a research of a conference research paper, it is possible that they won't even bother looking for it because they have 10 papers to review by next Thursday. Armed with these tools, I'd suggest that you first go back to your paper and check if you have uh, implemented these guidelines. If not, revise them based on these guidelines. If you'd like, bring this paper tomorrow and we'll try to have an activity where you take a small section of it and improve it. In fact, tonight you can go and see if you had the problem stated, if, you ha if your problem was, uh, the, the importance of the problem was explained and so on. All the guidelines that we talked about today. The graphics aspect. The second suggestion I have for you is give it to a colleague, maybe a senior colleague who has more experience in, in publishing. They might be able to say why it got rejected and use their tips. The importance of friendly peer reviews can't be overstated. Use your colleagues, it's not, they're not going to judge you. Their comments are going to help make your paper better and you might return the favor one day for them. Um, I think those are the two main comments. So, firstly, be aware of what re referees are looking for and hopefully these two days will give you a sufficient set of ideas about that. Secondly, run your paper with more experience by more experienced colleagues and take their suggestion, suggestions more seriously. It is a, it's a disheartening place to be if that happens. Well, I, I can, I'll give you one more reason why that might happen. Sometimes you might have submitted to a conference where the themes of the conference were different than what the theme of your paper was. So your paper might be very well written, but it just didn't fit the overall theme of the conference. Check if that happened. If you think your paper was really well written and it had a coherent flow, see if in terms of topics it did match. So it is a, it's not an easy question to answer, but I hope some of these tips will help you improve the paper. Next question from Erode. Over to you, Erode. Madam, our participants having three questions, madam. Question number one, what is the difference between national paper, national conference paper content and international paper contents, conference content? The second one, what should be the contents of extended abstract? And finally, uh, one small silly question, sir. Right from the morning, we are discussing about the techniques of paper writing or it is a technical paper writing. Over and out, madam. Okay, thanks for your questions. I think I'll begin with the third one first because it's fresh in my mind. And I should say that there is no such thing as a silly question. It's really not a silly question, but I'm not sure if I understood it very precisely. Let me try to clarify it. When you use the word, when we say technical paper, what I mean by technical here is something that would be published in a serious academic journal, regardless of the domain. There are differences between domains. In fact, there are differences between papers of computer science and papers of electrical engineering, even though they are very related. There are perhaps wider differences between papers in engineering and papers in education or if we go farther, papers in history. So the word, when we say technical here, technical content, we mean serious academic content. We are not going to deviate to domains which are very different from, or the, the guidelines we have been talking about so far hold true for papers in engineering, science, mathematics, computer science, educational technology, at least these. These are papers that among as faculty members here, we have some collective experience and all of us are saying the same thing. Now, with the, for such papers, what are the strategies, what are the techniques that would help make the paper clearer, stronger, more effective and so on has been the topic of our discussion all of today. Okay, your second question going one step backward is about extended abstracts. And unfortunately, we haven't had too much time to talk about normal abstracts yet. 
Professor Kannan did mention a little bit about it. We will try to come to normal abstracts tomorrow. And in that context, I might briefly talk about extended abstracts. I know that some conferences do it, but what you can think of an extended abstract uh, is, uh, or let us do one thing. Tomorrow when we talk about abstract writing, we will see how you can write or how to write abstracts of 50 words, which is say about 4 lines versus abstracts of 300 words. And you can, we will look at what must go into the 50 word abstract, what must go into the 300 words. First, what we will do is try to find out what must go into an abstract. And then we will try to look at differences. Again, as I said try because I am not sure of how much time we will have for that activity. If we cannot do it on, uh, if we cannot do it live tomorrow, we will at least pick up that question on the Moodle forum. And your first question was, can somebody help me here? National, thanks. National conferences versus international conferences. Unfortunately, I still do not understand that question very well because in my mind, I am not classifying conferences as international or, or national. The, your institution might. My institution does, in fact. It, on the one hand, it is a label. On the other hand, it can be about the content that is there in it. So, there is no rule that says that all national conferences are blue in color and all international conferences are yellow. There is no such rule. That is why I cannot answer your question very easily. What I would ask you to focus on more is the quality of papers that have been published in that conferences in that conference in the previous years and see if it is, if you feel your paper fits there and if you feel that the quality is, uh, that the conference is maintaining at some standard and use those metrics to judge which conference you want to send your paper to. Of course, if your institution has rules, you have to follow it. You have to overrule everything that I am saying. Next question, VIT Pune, over to you. I want to ask, a lot of engineers are taking up PhD work these days. So, <coughs> considering the limitation of the individual, I want to know whether there is any forum which will certify that similar work has, been, has not been done previously and there are no chances of repetition of the work. And my second question is, what is the difference between project report and research paper? Are those the same? Thanks for your questions, VIT Pune. Second question, first again, because that is always the freshest. Yes, there is a big difference between project report and a conference paper. If you were there in today morning session, session 2, that was the very first activity that we started out with. Again, just to briefly summarize, project report is a report of your work. All the details have to be mentioned. If uh, certain questions need to be answered to uh, if you are, for example, if your supervisor of the project, the project manager has some questions, you have to answer it in the report. The funding agency needs some answers, that has to be there in the report. But essentially, it is a report of what you did, period. Lots of details. A conference paper has all these other aspects that we have talked about all day today. Problem statements, importance of problems, uh, related work. So, if you just go back and think about everything else that we talked about today, those are not necessarily there in a project report. What we will do again, as I said, is we will post these slides on Moodle and you will take a look at, you can take a look at uh, the first, very first slide from session 2 today morning. And the question is, is this, uh, it's first or the second one, is this a, confer is this a pro uh, conference paper, is this a research paper? Most of you said, no, this looks like a project report, it is not a conference paper, it is not a research paper because it is only about your work. It does not talk of context, importance and so on. First question again, I will have to ask the audience to help me here. <laughs> ah, forum to judge, is there any forum to judge if previous work has been done before? I am not aware of an explicit forum as such. So, if anybody else wants to answer that question, Please go ahead. I am not going to say either yes or no. All I am saying is I do not know. But again, a better attitudinal stance to take is to do the hard work oneself because that is really how science progresses. That is how knowledge is created in the community. Do the hard work oneself. 
look at the relevant work. Of course, if you know other people who are doing similar work, talk to them, share your references between each other. But there is no Google that where you can feed in the, well, there is a Google where you can feed in some talk, some uh, phrases from your work and see if it gives back any reasonable hits. Do it on Google Scholar instead of Google. But if you are, say, has anybody else done this work and put the question in quotes, it is unlikely Google is going to say, Google or some other automated agent is going to say yes or no. I do not know of any. So, I have to plead ignorance here. Sastra University, over to you. Next question, please. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I am having doubt regarding, uh, we have, uh, for, we are focused on the developing of the paper, ma'am, but how to give a suitable title to the paper, because we will do r several algorithms and several techniques for, uh, for the entire paper. How to give a suitable title, because if the entire algorithm and uh, approach will be come to the title, means it, the title will be very big. So how to give a suitable title and another another doubt is what is the difference between the novel paper and uh, survey paper ma'am that's all thank you ma'am okay thank you good questions as professor sunoj taught us to say this morning but i sin sincerely mean it the first question especially is something we all have to struggle with because the two title must be must reflect our work it must accurately represent our work Ideally, it should represent all our work, but it is a title. You cannot have it run more than one line, maybe two lines, cannot be long. It has to be attractive and so on. So, there, there are these competing issues and how do we select. If we had done activity 2 today, there was a slide in it. You can take a look at the paper template if you want. We will discuss it again tomorrow as to how to choose a paper title. I will just try to reply this in brief today and we will come back to this tomorrow. Uh, remember this idea of key contribution that we have been talking about since morning? Use that to decide your title. So, once you know what the key focus or the key concept of your paper is, identify focus, make sure there is no more than one or two, fo one or two uh, points of focus and so on. So, identify the focus of your paper and also identify the contributions, your contributions. Write that out. And then what I would suggest is think of three titles, for example, that reflect your key contributions and somehow also have the main concept, the key focus underlined within the title itself. Once you have these three titles, then you can start playing with it. Just the first is a brainstorming exercise. You can even ask your colleague, here I have three titles, all three of them represent my contribution pretty accurately which one sounds more effective? That is one way to go about it. So, the homework you have to do before you write your title is identify the key contribution. The reason that is important is what if the referee has only sufficient time to read the title and nothing else? Usually people do not throw out papers with uh, based on title, but suppose I see a paper called a new way to use Moodle. I would be really reluctant to read the rest of the paper. I will have to, I as a referee or I as a reader will have to get, gather a lot of energy to even decipher what this person is doing. On the other hand, suppose your title was uh, project, ba project based learning implemented through Moodle for first year programming. Then I know what your key contribution is and your paper at this in, in an instant looks a lot more interesting. So, I think going the route of the key contribution should help you decide on the title. Let us uh, look at the next question from uh, MANIT Bhopal. Good evening ma'am, I am Ruchi Gupta from Bansal College of Engineering. My question is, how abstract of a research paper should be made and what are its mandatory constraints? Over to you. Thanks for the question. How should the abstract be written? What are the crucial features that must go into it? And I am going to use another strategy that Professor Sunod said, but not because I do not know the answer, but because we have a small mini activity tomorrow or in one of the sessions tomorrow, we will be talking exactly about this. So, if you can just hold on till tomorrow afternoon and if I have not answered your question till then, please repeat your question. But 
how to write the abstract is something which is important similar to how to write the title, because these are two things which people will first read. Uh, to give a very brief answer, you are, uh, Professor Kandan did answer this to some extent in the morning. Actually, he gave some very good suggestions that do not write about general ideas in your abstract. Do not, do not say technology is a very important uh, new development in education. Instead, say what you did. So, that is, I am just summarizing what he said. And I think I will leave this question here right now. We will come to details tomorrow. Next question, Truba College, Indore, over to you. My question is, could you guide us regarding the maximum or minimum number of references which to be included in a ref, uh, conference or a general paper? Over to you. Thanks for your question. What is the maximum or the minimum number of references that one should write in a research paper? There is no unique maximum or minimum number. I am sure you are not happy to hear that answer, uh, but that is really the state of affairs. There is, I cannot say one is minimum and ten a maximum or so on, but here are guidelines. Use the number of references that are needed to talk about related work, prior work related to your paper. If you need to refer to 10 previous articles, if you absolutely need to do it, you have to include all 10. If you need to do it, if you need to include 20 references on various aspects, you have to include 20. However, if you know that there are 12 articles, all of them talking about the same issue, you need not refer to all 12. There, what you do is make a choice depending on which of those 12 capture most of the issues that you are talking about. So, I will give you an example here. Let us say uh, we were doing this paper A and paper B, and you wanted to talk about benefits of visualizations. There are over 100, maybe my colleagues and students here can maybe say that there are 300 papers or 500 on benefits of visualizations. Of course, we are not going to talk about all 500. We will first shortlist them or look at the ones which talk about the benefits from the perspective we are looking for. So, if we are looking for students understanding of dynamic processes using visualizations, we will shortlist it along that category. And let us say even then, there are 15 such papers. Look at whether any of those 15 is a survey paper that refers to all the other papers, all the other 14. If so, it is sufficient to cite that one survey paper. Maybe you can make a note somewhere saying refer this article and references within. If there is no single paper that encompasses all other references, then I would say pick some representative number. Sometimes people go by the most recent references as a guideline. At other times, people go by the guideline that they will pick the most seminal or the most cited papers. So, all these are valid guidelines to decide how many references you have to include. If you include very few references, and again there is no number here, but let us say your paper had only one reference, it would raise a flag, because it means either that you are unaware of work done regarding your topic, that is not a good thing to do. It is very unlikely that one and only one other person has talked about any of the ideas you mentioned in your paper. Worse, it means that you know of it and you are unwilling to acknowledge it. So, both those situations are not good. Um, I think that that is all I have to say here. If you say that I am going to include 200, well, you are welcome to, but that is going to take 4 pages and that is 4 valuable pages out of a 6 page paper. So, you have to strike a balance here, but the earlier guidelines that I suggested that try to shortlist on the basis of papers that talk about exactly those issues that you are discussing in your paper. And secondly, try to find the ones that include all the other papers that would help you come to a reasonable number. In uh, one of the previous 
participants had asked a question. I had forgotten to mention that. I think he asked, what's the difference between a research paper for a conference and a survey paper? I, I remembered it because I mentioned a survey paper. Survey paper is exactly that. It, survey, it does a very comprehensive, very thorough survey of a fairly well-defined topic or subtopic. In a way, it tells the reader what are all the things that other people have done related to this subtopic. So, you can think of writing a survey paper on benefits of visualizations in teaching and learning. It is going to be a very long survey paper because the benefits can be in terms of student engagement, in terms of teacher engagement, in terms of learning, in terms of technology. You may find it a slightly easier thing to do to write a survey paper on benefits of teaching and uh, benefits of visualizations for learning engineering concepts. A well written survey paper is detailed, is comprehensive and the rigor has to be shown. How did you select these papers? How do you know that your search is sufficient? How have you done? How can you prove comprehensiveness and so on? It is a very good idea for research students, PhD students who are somewhere near the beginning of their research. I would not say absolute beginning, but let us say if you are in your second year or so, it is a good idea to try to write a survey paper, because that will give you a good handle on um, what is being done in the field. But a research conference usually, I am not saying it would not, but you have to check if the research conference you are interested in also accepts survey papers. Often they do not. They might say, they might have a track that survey papers are welcome in this track. If so, do submit it. If they say that original work only, please do not submit a survey paper there. Kakinada Institute, Kakinada, over to you. Good evening, ma'am. My question is, how to find out counterfeit journal? Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, this is, I am not sure if I am really qualified to answer this. The question is, how do you identify a counterfeit journal that does not really exist? Okay, if I were in your situation, if I were a novice researcher in a field and I had to make a choice of publishing in some journal, see that the, uh, these days, with the ease of online publishing, there are several dozen journals in a given field. Sometimes there are several hundreds. So, how do you know which journals are real and which are fake in some way? I would first ask my senior experienced colleagues if they know anything about these journals. Second place I might look for, I am just thinking of what I would do if I were in your situation. Ask your guide, ask your senior colleagues. Second thing you can do is, suppose you knew a well known researcher in that field or you knew some well known researchers or some well known papers, often cited papers. See if these, if the references in these papers contain the journal that you are looking for. That might give you another clue. Again, it would not tell you if, if, if your journal does not or the journal of your interest does not appear in any of these papers, it does not mean it is counterfeit. But if it does appear, you know that it is a genuine journal. Any, uh, I am going to throw this question open to my colleagues here. Any other suggestions? Okay, so perhaps put this question up on Moodle, see if you get any other creative ideas. If you are able to publish in well known journals, and by well known, I mean where. Uh, the articles are often cited and you see mentions of these articles in other research articles and all. If you are able to do it, you are in good shape. But if for some reason you have to choose a journal which you have never seen before, you perhaps should make a check of it with some other experienced colleague. SGS ITS Indore, over to you. Ma'am, my question is, uh, what are the selection criteria for a research paper? Uh, do they differ for conferences or journals and how one can uh, select or reject a paper based on abstract because if you are writing effectively any conference paper and many uh, conferences and journals they prefer abstract first or some they prefer sometimes they prefer full journal paper. The question is what are the selection criteria of research papers are they different for journals and uh, for uh, conferences. I think this journals versus conferences we have talked 
about it a few times and there really isn't much more that I'd I have to share with you regarding that. Um, Professor Kannan also talked about it this morning, what is the difference, what are some differences, the review time was one, the novelty aspect was one and beyond that I would say sound features in a conference paper are also sound features in a research paper and so on. Now, it is true that there are some uh, conferences that only ask for abstract and decide based on the abstract. So, what, again let me postpone this question to tomorrow, what must be there in the abstract, so that the referee uh, at least is likely to go on, I will postpone a detailed discussion of this tomorrow, for tomorrow. But again in brief, if your key contributions are stated in the abstract and if you can show some plausibility, some evidence in the abstract itself, it is good, because then you have made a strong claim and you have also shown that you are defending it all in the 10 lines available in the abstract. An abstract that is likely to get rejected is one which is very general that talks about why technology is good in education or talks about uh, why one must follow guidelines while writing programs. So, if the more broad you are, the more likely that the, and if you are broad and rambling and do not get to your contribution soon, there is a higher probability, again I am speaking loosely here, but there is a higher probability that your paper will be rejected. More details tomorrow. Baramati, over to you. Myself, Professor Thakre, my question is, is it necessary always to quote the references? It may happen in uh, engineering uh, paper that sometimes because of the innovative ideas or innovative research, there would not be any uh, references earlier. So, if this is so, what should be done? Okay, thank you. The question is, is it necessary to have references and especially what to do if your idea is so innovative, so new that nobody else has done it before. I will take this question in two parts, actually three parts. First part is, even if your own idea is absolutely new, it will have to be based on something, some context, some problem. So, maybe your solution is very new, but maybe the problem is old. If the problem is old, you have to establish the importance of the problem. While establishing the importance of the problem, there comes your references, there come your uh, related prior work. So, it is highly unlikely that there is every idea in your paper or every sentence in your paper is something very new. Most of us go from familiar to unfamiliar, old to new and so on. Next, suppose you are in a situation where you are solving an old problem, but with a, with a completely new approach that nobody else has done before. Establish why the problem is important and how other people have solved it and then say that nobody has solved it using the technique that we have done. That is the second part to your answer. I first interpreted your question in a different way. I thought you are asking when can we not refer, uh, not cite a known result. So, let us say you were uh, writing about high school mechanics forces and you have used Newton's law, Newton's second law. You do not have to put a citation to Newton's Principia if you are simply using Newton's second law, because it is something that has appeared in textbooks now for the past several hundred years. So, you will have to take a call there whether the knowledge is something so commonly used and if, if it is such a frequently used part in your domain that you do not have to refer to it, then that is ok. Newton's law is, an, is one of those things. If you say Newton's law, everybody knows that it was Newton who published it, most people know or many people know approximately when it was done, what it says and so on. Um, for new and in innovative work, however, is even let us say the problem you are solving is also new you have a harder job there, because you have to convince the readers why your problem is important, if the problem itself is new. And when you are trying to convince the reader why your problem is important, you will automatically start needing to cite 
other related work. Let me do one thing here. Since we have done one full round uh, and it is almost 6 o'clock, so I look at the chat window for a few minutes and we will have, we will try to have one of these sessions again tomorrow afternoon. So, let us wind up the two way interaction window. I will look at the chat window a little bit and see if uh, there are some questions that have not yet been answered. Okay, let me just mention some of the questions in the chat window and I, uh, there is one question on what should be the contents of a review paper. I am going to use the word review paper as something similar to a survey paper and I did answer it earlier. Can this review paper be accepted by a conference? Look at the conference themes. Look at the conference tracks also. See if they say that they will accept such papers. What is the format for a conference paper writing? Every conference decides its format. In most engineering conferences, it is the IEEE format, not all, most. Okay, this is a question which we will come back to tomorrow. It says the papers we discussed today were in the style of report writing. I am not sure what that means, but I will go ahead to the next sentence. In IEEE format, the style of explaining is activity performed and observations done. Which style should we adopt? I think there are two separate issues here. Which style and which format are decided by the conference format and by the conference program committee? What we discussed today, I, I would like to stress this once again. We did not say that this, these should be the sections and this should be the order of the sections in your paper. We said that if you have to have a flow, the, such a flow where you have an overall idea first and details later will help the reader understand your idea better than if you give lots of detail first, details first. We also looked at the various aspects or characteristics or features of a well written conference paper. We did not, what we did not say is this is exactly each of these uh, aspects should become a section. That is not what I am claiming. So, I would like you to think of the difference and understand the difference between the features, the characteristics, the properties, you can use any of these words of a conference paper, of a research paper and distinguish it from the actual format. Format will help you decide sections and subsections which should come first and so on. So, let us officially wind up today's session. We will begin again tomorrow at 9.30.